Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we offer thought leadership for wholesale change agents like you. My name is Ian Heller. I'll be your co-host today, along with my business partner. And the answer to the question, what would you get if you crossed James Bond with Rain Man? Jonathan Vine, PhD, aka the doctor of distribution. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? The name is Bine, John Bine. <laughs> yeah, that's a little, I didn't thought about that. I should have, well, I, it sounds better when you say it. You do a better uh, but, Welsh but, but I could also, I could also, I could also do Bean. Bean. Yeah, well, that would be it's like a, Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean, right? Mr. Yeah. Bean and James Bond. I mean, these are, you know, not the Between same. the two of them, right? You got it covered. That, you do have it covered. That There's no doubt about that. So before we get started, we have a great guest today, but before we get started, I want to thank Epicor, who sponsors the Wholesale Chain Show. For nearly 50 years, Epicor has helped distributors stay ahead with flexible, powerful solutions designed to increase sales, streamline operations, and improve customer experience. Epicor's industry-leading distribution ERP solutions are built specifically to meet the unique needs of wholesalers with everything you need to grow your sales, profits, and productivity while distancing yourself from the competition. We all want to do that. Epicor is focused on the things that matter to you. Work queues, PO, variance queues, kitting, assembly, and production orders, advanced inventory forecasting, VMI, and special project pricing. They build their software using industry best practices and 50 years of distribution experience. But Epicor's solutions are far more than just tools for picking, packing, and shipping. Fully cloud-based with a modern UI, Epicor offers complete, robust e-commerce solutions, powerful BI, and analytics tools, modern API and EDI, value-added services, WMS, virtual assistance, and much more. You can learn more about Epicor, about how Epicor helps thousands of wholesalers succeed by visiting epicor.com slash distribution. So thanks to Epicor, you make this show possible and we appreciate it. Now I want to bring in our guest. We're very fortunate today to have Peter Newberger. Peter is a C the CEO of United Metals, and he's graciously agreed to share his time with us today to talk about a variety of ways in which distributors can add value, differentiate themselves from the competition. Peter, good morning. How are you? I'm doing really well, Ian and Jonathan. Thanks for having me on your show today. Well, it's great to have you. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, Jonathan's been raving about you for years to me, and, and finally we meet. So it's nice to make your acquaintance and frankly, I hope you live up to the billing. Uh, I'm not making any promises for Jonathan's credibility. But let's be clear. <laughs> but prior to the show, we figured that there was a really good possibility of putting together Newberger, Heller, and buying law firm. So if you're injured in an accident. Well, that's our fallback position, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's a little problem of having to go to law school. Other than that, I think we're all set. <laughs> That's so, uh, so Peter, uh, we have your background in front of us. Uh, so, uh, if you could we go through part, it, we have part of his background, by the way. I mean, it is a long resume of senior executive roles. So, I I picked and chose a few that I thought were relevant, Peter. But if there's more, let us know. Okay. So, Peter, you want to walk us through it? And remember, remember that we have a lot of people on podcasts, so you'll have to uh, make sure you, they know which title you're talking about or which degree you're talking about as you go through it. Great. Well, I I would say you know. Um, you know, my path into the uh, distribution world really started after I got out of graduate school and went to work for Norton Abrasives, um, division of St. Cobain now. And uh, after a few years there, I was fortunate to be put in, in a position as the director of marketing and distribution, which gave me a chance to work with the national network of cutting tool abrasive and uh, mill supply houses. And uh, while I was at Norton was kind of the very early noises around integrated supply were coming out. And I ended up doing a bunch of speaking to distribution groups about the opportunity to change the distribution model for uh, large scale programs and ended up getting hired by some venture capitalists to start a company um, that became Strategic Distribution Inc. Um, and, and launched into the integrated supply marketplace back in the mid nineties. Um, and, and after doing that for a number of years that company went public and I got out and got into building products distribution, which you see uh, on the slide as designer building solutions. We started with one location in Denver and grew that to be a large regional distributor of a whole suite of interior finished products. So we did things like put the countertops in 8,000 Starbucks, but we also were putting products in 
uh, depending upon the market from 25 to 75% of the homes in places like Denver, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Dallas. Um, and then some of you are old enough to remember that between 08 and 010, everybody stopped building everything simultaneously. <laughs> and at that point, uh, I joined uh, IDG um, to take on the leadership role for their integrated supply business. And uh, we had a successful run growing that, ended up getting bought by Hogemeyer, um, which is when that title change occurred. Uh, and that company is now known as Valum still uh, a major and a wonderful company in the marketplace. Um, and then I went back into manufacturing. Uh, GNO Manufacturing is a company that makes specialty stainless um, tube, welded tube products. And uh, that company got bought by uh, O'Neill Industries, ONI, and changed names to GNL Tube. And then uh, ONI asked me to take on the leadership role of another company they owned, United Performance Metals, headquartered in Cincinnati. Uh, specialty global supplier of, of steel to the aerospace, uh, space, medical, and uh, other uh, non-carbon steel products. And that's where I am today. Got it. And United Performance Metals is like a metal services center. Is that a fair yeah, description? Yeah, exactly. It, right. it, it is a metal service center, but we only um, uh, deal in uh, nickel alloys, cobalt alloys, titanium, and, uh, and stainless. We don't have any carbon products. Got it. Okay, good, good. And uh, and along the way, I know you're too polite to mention this, but you have an MBA from Harvard. Uh, we won't hold it against you. Um, Thank you. But uh, well, good for you. He's clear, he's clearly learned what they don't teach you at the Harvard Business School, based on this <laughs> resume. <laughs> good. Well, you know, so you've you've been in a lot of high value added distribution for a long time, and of course, one of the things we stress, Peter, is that, well, you know, the the days of the company specific website being the destination for simple orders is over. I mean, simple yeah. orders are at least the heyday of it. Yeah. Uh, the, the simple orders in B2B are gonna go to marketplaces in our opinion, just like the simple orders go to marketplaces in retail. And now, you know, but B2B has a lot more opportunity to add value. The relationships are more complex, the customer needs are more complex even the customer segmentation is more complex, right? Because in yeah. consumer marketing, everybody's an individual. That's your only form of segmentation. In B2B, you have to segment establishments and then the people within them. You know, So for example, the production leader, the, 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 whether it's the superintendent on the job site or the production manager in the plant, they're often at odds with their own purchasing people because they have different objectives. So you get this complex segmentation uh, that reflects a complex set of varying customer needs. So it's not the same thing. So, so those disruptors are going to make a lot of ground in B2B, but they can't wipe us out, I don't think, the way that they can retailers because retailers were pretty much all simple transactions and that's only a portion of our business. And that's sort of our working hypothesis. Do you want to, based on your experience with so much value added selling, which we don't normally ha have in distribution, I mean, we, there's always some of that with you, it's very high value added. How do you think about this sort of dilemma of, dis of disruption? Well, I think, I, I think that I agree with your fundamental premise. Um, I think one thing, um, there might be a few people left in the world that were alive in the, the early 90s when uh, I gave a speech to 800 Norton distributors about how distribution was going to change radically. And uh, as I've told Jonathan, I think I was right, but I was like 40 years, thought it would happen 40 years faster than it did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, think your, I think your premise is right. I think um, with the benefit of more seniority now, the trends do take place a little slower. And I think that that can be a trap where people see things happening. It's the, well, Amazon hasn't taken my business yet. So clearly I'm safe forever, right? I, I, I think that you're, you're right on target. Uh, I think I long took the approach, maybe because I started with a manufacturer and to take a step back, when I was at Norton, one of the things I did was trained our distribution network on how to do activity-based cost analysis so that they could look at specifically what the cost to serve different customers were. And I looked at the channel that way as a series of activities that each had cost and value and tried to define a channel that said, well, who's the most efficient provider of this step? And how much can you afford to pay them to do that? And as a manufacturer, I looked at the margin my distributors earned as my payments to them for services provided. 
And I think as distributors, we have the opportunity to do that at both ends, right? With the customer and with the supplier to say, what are we doing that's adding value and how much value is it adding? And, and that ultimately determines, you know, the economics of our business. And, and so to your point, if what you're doing is providing logistics, I mean, I said back in 1995, if you're to distributors, if your expertise is delivering packages, are you going to be better at that than UPS and FedEx? Like you're probably not, and you're not going to have the scale. So I think your premise is exactly right. You have to find the things that are not susceptible to the efficiencies of the marketplace. And, and that's where you can stake your ground and have a protected position, in my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting because Amazon is better at delivering than UPS, right? So they have this combination of capabilities where they're a world-class merchant, they're a world-class logistics provider, and a world-class technology company. No competitor in the world has that level of strengths in all three areas, which gives them the unique capabilities of building marketplaces and competing uh, across the whole industry. And I really think it's going to, my personal opinion, it's going to take a consortium of distributors, logistics giants like UPS, and a technology giant like maybe Google or somebody uh, to compete if we ever want to build our own marketplace. But I want to get away from marketplaces for a minute because that's not really where you play. In right. the metal services center, I mean, that's a super highly value added area. So what are your customer relationships like? I mean, what are the services you're typically offering for your customers? So um, the customer relationships that we, we have uh, are largely, um, well, about 55% of our business is on contracts, but 45% is transactional. But half of that transactional business is pseudo contracts. It's repetitive orders with the same customers uh, at, at, at agreed upon pricing levels. So uh, only about a quarter of our business is purely transactional. Um, and that's fundamentally based on the fact that we are providing services. Only about 15% of the metal that we sell comes in and goes out in the same form. Hmm. So we are not how, how, much, how much, how much, 15, 15%. Wow. One, one five. Yeah. Okay, one five percent yeah. comes in and maybe we break bulk, right? We, we, right. we bring in and, and, and the other 85%, we basically cut one way or another. We're either cutting a long product like bar to length, or we're cutting sheet or we're slitting coil um, or we're cutting um, rough parts. We, we have uh, a service we call first step processing where we don't just break bulk from the mill anymore. We cut the rough shape of the product for the customer. So we're moving one step further down their assembly line. And um, you know that's been a key to the fact that our, our margins typically run twice what the industry average for steel service center runs at because we're providing more value, bringing that product further into the customer stream uh, you know, of production and at the same time, you know, it makes us very difficult to dislodge. So, so um, I would say we focus on identifying what it is that the customer does when they first get the metal. And we look and see if we can do that more cost effectively than they can. And, and so we have very high level relationships. When we, when we put a program to place for, um, you know, a large aerospace engine manufacturer, we're talking at corporate vice president levels. We're not talking to a purchasing agent in a plant. And, and, and in my experience, you made the, uh, you know, the, the good description earlier, production versus purchasing, right? And fundamentally, we usually see purchasing trying to beat you down on price and production trying, trying to squeeze more value added services out of you. So our, our approach has been get to a higher level in the organization where we can discuss the total cost of ownership and, and, and have them settle that for us. And then once they define in the value added services, we're happy to be competitive with price with purchasing against other people providing the same level of service. Mm -hmm. But what we want to avoid is, is, is you know, getting stuck in a purchasing agent debate about cost versus value. Does That's that terrific. Sense? I want to remind our listeners, by the way, that you can ask questions. There's a way to submit a formal question or failing that you can submit a chat and we're happy to take those questions. So Peter, I think it would be helpful. Um, your company is really unique in the space. Maybe talk about where it fits in the family of the O'Neill companies. 
So O'Neill Industries, O and I, is a family-owned group of companies, um, and in fact, this year is the hundredth anniversary of the founding of the first company. Um, and within that group, there are uh, different companies that service different segments in the market, as you point out, Jonathan. O'Neill Steel is a traditional carbon-based service center company. Lico is a wholesale steel plate only um, uh, distributor. O'Neill Manufacturing Services is what happened when O'Neill Steel started providing more and more services for customers to the point where it became a different business, becoming manufacturer. So they separated manufacturing and distribution. And both of those companies now grow on their own path. TW Metals is a mostly tube and a tubular product, but uh, they get into other forms of metal as well. Um, wholesale distributor that's a global company. And then um, recently they uh, O&I purchased GNL Tube, which I mentioned where I was the president um, to manufacture tubing um, that uses steel that comes through the um, you know, UPM's slitting operation and gets sold through TW's um, operation, but but primarily GNL was already selling a lot of tubing directly into manufacturers. So, so within that family, your 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 business UPM is at is at the more value added end of the spectrum, or the most even. No, uh, um, O'Neill Manufacturing is is a pure contract manufacturing play. Mm -hmm. We are the most value added distributor. Distributor. Okay, that's what yeah. that's what I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the O'Neill Steel has grown um, faster than the market, but they've done it via creating a marketplace to make Ian happy. <laughs> they, they, they've used an e-commerce vehicle to dramatically accelerate their growth of commodity mm -hmm. products. Um, whereas we have focused more on the value added services for specific industries. And let me tell our listeners what's extraordinary about that marketplace for steel. Um, we do an annual um, assessment of what companies can actually offer an e-commerce transaction. And it's exhaustive. We look at 3,000 to 4,000 websites a year. The, the um, metal services centers and offices is an absolute laggard as a sector um, in e-commerce adoption. And so the fact that you have a sister company within this group that has just hit it out of the park is astounding. It's really amazing. Yeah, that company had very uh, visionary leadership. And the um, foundation of the company is that it will remain a family owned company for another hundred years. And uh, so at uh, they're not afraid to make investments with longer term horizons than a typical private equity owned firm would be. And I think that gave them the, uh, uh, the courage to go ahead and say, hey, we have to differentiate. We agree with you guys where, where the, the market's going and we wanna be uh, you know, an early adopter as opposed to a laggard. Yeah, so I think it's an interesting way to differentiate because it's, uh, I mean, these are really strong modes. I, mean, I suppose you could argue that some digital player is eventually gonna get into your line of work, but it looks like it's a hundred years away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, the, the, one of our premises about those disruptors is that they like to avoid variable costs. They wanna push, push that off on the third party fulfillment company. Um, and you have a lot of variable costs, but you're getting paid for it. And it's super valuable to the customer because you're taking over work that they would otherwise have to do. And then arguably, if you're pulling that for a variety of customers, you can do it cheaper than they can one at a time. Um, and you're really into their the heart of their, their operations. I mean, if you think about the uh, Michael Porter diagram, mm -hmm. you know, whether there's, you know, there's inputs and then there's some kind of value add and then their outputs, you're not just selling to the inputs, to the purchasing people. Well, that's why you're not talking to purchasing agents. Right you're part of their value add uh, in, in between their inputs and outputs. And so it's really uh, a, a, an essential activity for them. It's core to how they add value for their customers. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful and it's differentiated and it's sustainable, I think. I think so. And I think it's a big distinction. You know, uh, half my career has been spent in indirect materials and in indirect materials, you know, there's a lot more focus on the logistics piece and the, the, the price and the value add comes around helping your customer select the right product, Yeah, right. right? So you're getting a better cutting tool or a better abrasive grinding wheel. Um, but now when our product becomes part of the product, 
right? Yeah. Our, our, our product, uh, when we sell to Pratt & Whitney or GE, that metal ends up in the engine that takes off with the plane. And, and so it's much more critical um, in the way they look at it than if we were selling them as I used to, the grinding wheels to finish those parts. Yeah, I think um, there are other opportunities for dis for distributors to do that, but they they just don't, right? So I had a food ingredients distributor as a customer one time, and they were constantly in this dynamic tension where their suppliers could go around them yeah. because you know the big lots, a lot of cross docking, yeah. um, and part of their strategy was okay is there a way we can sort of pre-mix these ingredients or provide some of the value add and take costs so that we're, we move past the purchasing agent and into the production and we can talk to corporate vice presidents like you do. Yeah. Do you see other sectors in your long experience with distribution where there are opportunities to do that, but maybe people aren't? I, I think I've seen it in every place I've been. They're, they're not gonna be exactly analogous, but you know, the way we grew the, the two integrated supply companies I grew was not by calling on the MRO buyer. It was by right. calling on the CFO, you, you know, and I, and I think by showing them how you could bundle together, you know, in the indirect material world, the, the big challenge for customers was that all their costs were parts of separate little buckets. And, and, and so the, the, the real challenge was getting high enough in the organization that you could say, I can affect your costs in five different buckets. It's not just the part of the cutting tool. It's the labor in the tool crib. It's the recycling. It's the energy. It's the inventory. And those were all in different buckets. Um, I, I think, you know, my overriding theme that, that gets outside of my own business is, you know, companies need to be very intentional and how they go about creating value add. In my experience, most of the companies I run into, you say, well, why are you doing that? Well, a customer asked us to, or we had to, um, you know, to keep a customer happy. It was more reactive. And I think you need to be aware and decide what problem are you gonna solve for your customer? In the case of your, your food products, right? Is mixing an issue? Is there efficiency gains by doing that? If there is, great. If there's not, then just because you can do it doesn't mean it adds value. And this really gets to, you know, sort of your thesis about this. This is the only slide we have and you might want to, you know, read it as you go, but you want to kind of walk us through this slide. Yeah. Distribution strategy value add. And, and, and so the first line to me is, you know, it's just kind of baseline. In the long run, you only capture the value you create. You'll right. see customers that'll overpay for things in the short term or underpay. But in the long run, you have to create value if you want to capture it. And I feel like distributors are lucky to be in the middle. And, and I say that a little tongue in cheek because we so often hear about eliminate the middleman and add value to the customer. But we're there because we add value. And being in the middle means that we can add value either to our suppliers or to our customers. And, and that gives us some great advantages. And my, my final point about most vendors and customers are also between other steps in the channel is when you think about value creation, I think it's beneficial to think about the entire supply chain for your product. And, and you know, we're actually now supplying feedstock metal to atomizers who are turning it into powder for 3D printing. Hmm. And we're supplying them with the metal. They atomize it. We then distribute the powder and in doing so, I found the ancillary products that go around. It turns out in metal, every 3D printed product needs to be printed on a base plate. Well, nobody in the 3D printing world wants to manage a base plate program. So it's another place where we can add value and say, hey, you just design and print the parts. We'll take care of everything else. And, and it's allowing the scale of these small companies to get into 3D printing without having massive machine shop complexes to go along with it. So... I think we're lucky to be in the middle. Um, and, and I think that we need to be intentional, as I say, where we identify specifically what's the problem we're solving and who are we solving it for? Are we solving the problem for our, our vendor or for our customer? And, and can we do it more efficiently than who's ever doing it now? Right. If not, probably shouldn't do it. If we are, then we've defined something. And I think you also need to think about what the impact on your own company is very specifically. Are you doing this to increase your scale? Are you doing this to increase your margins? Are you doing this to get into new customer segments? 
but I think you need to think about what's the problem you're solving, who are you solving it for, why are you solving this problem, what impact on your business, and then I think a subtle but often overlooked point is before you solve that problem, get your customer or your supplier to agree what it's costing them today. Right? We have the customer or the vendor who will say, hey, can you do this for me? I'll pay you 100 bucks. Great. Jump in and do it. Two years from now, they go, hey, 100 seems like a lot. I want to give you 50. Well, if you initially did the price study that showed it was costing them 200 and they signed off on that, Two years from now, when they come back, you say, you know, that hundred is still half of what was costing you as we validated the savings and you have a much more defensible position. But I see a lot of companies jump in without that baseline data. And then later on, they're scrambling. I can't tell you how many accounts I called on for integrated supply that had another integrator on site. And I'd say, well, did the program deliver what they promised? And the answer was, I don't know. And to me, that's the worst possible answer, right? You want it to be yes or no. Um, so I think if you go through that intentional process of identifying the value add and then building the right expertise in your company, every distribution company has the opportunity to find um, value added, um, you know, value, value that they can create for the channel. Yeah, I'll go you one farther. They, sorry, Jonathan, just real quick. They, a lot of distributors will not only say, yes, we'll do that for you. They don't even talk about charging for it. Yeah. And then later on, they figure out, wait a minute, I have six people serving this account instead of five, and I'm not getting paid for the sixth person. Right. And that's what I mean by being reactive. And, and, uh, and if they had gone in and, and measured the impact before they started and got the customer to sign off on the baseline cost, they could have said at the beginning, hey, I'll hire a person to do this. You can let two people be reassigned. If I have one person do it, it's a more efficient model. But Otherwise, you just see this margin erosion as they add more services. And to me, value-added services should lead to margin enhancement. So Peter, in a company that you and I both know very well, this form of reactive value-added services is rampant where they think about, you know, customers, we've got a guy that can do X, a guy or a gal that can do X in one branch, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, we have no ability to replicate that expertise and we're not charging for it, right? Yeah, we're not measuring what the benefit is to the customer and we're not charging for it and we can't really do it anywhere else. But customer X had a production manager in that location that asked for it. And so they go, sure, we'll do it because yeah. we, we got to keep the customer happy. That's right. So let's, I know that the specific value added services of UPM are probably less relevant for most of our listeners, but if you could take us through your process, you've got a three or four step process for, for how you derive what the value add services might be. Yeah, so um, it, it, I'd say, it, it, I, I kind of tried to capture that with the, 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 the intentional piece. So we will go into a customer, um, you know, by forming high level relationships and we believe in relationship selling at high levels. So we will often have a relationship with an account for two or three years before we start doing significant business with them. And during that time, we're just trying to understand what are the customer's pain points. And once we understand those pain points, we start to identify well, which ones do we think we can help them solve, right? Because a customer will come to us sometimes with a pain point and we'll say, yeah, that's a pain point for us too. We, we really don't have a good answer. Um, but ideally we identify something that, that they don't want to do or are struggling to do and that we think we have the expertise to do. And we will do a, a, a model analysis to determine if we can do it for less than what they can. We'll then meet with the customer and sit down and say, hey, Here's how much you're spending on this. You know, we'll go in and do a, 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 a activity-based cost study of the customer's functionality. We think we can do it for pick a number, 40 or 50 percent less than that for you. Would that be valuable for you if we could do that? And 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 then you go through, you know, what are all the hurdles to implementing that step? So, in a lot of cases for us, you know, we're going into the plant and seeing what they're doing with the metal when they get it from us before it goes into their final production. And, and, you know, and, and we can't do everything, but we can do a lot of things. So we'll go in and say, hey, instead of selling you bar to the ASTM, which is a metal standard tolerance, 
What if we precision ground it before we delivered it to you? Because we see you take every bar we sell you and you precision grind it before you feed it into your um, m machines. And, 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 you know, we'll look at that and, and as an example and say, you know, because as, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, we have scale, we've got equipment in uh, 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 now 11 locations in Asia, Europe, and across North America, where we'll say, hey, we can provide this service for you for X amount, and we'll deliver right to the production line. Um, you know, at GNL Tube, we did things like discovered that for our automotive customers, they used specific size bins to move the whip around on their production line. We had them send us those, those containers and we cut the parts to the size that they would put them in, loaded the boxes, and now they just take the boxes directly to the assembly line when they get them. They used to take 20 foot pieces of tube and have to cut them up and load the boxes themselves. Well, we were doing 40,000 tube cuts a day. We were much more efficient at it than any of our customers. So we, we, we pulled it in house and, and delivered directly to the assembly line. In general, for our customers, we're trying to move further into the assembly line um, so, so that that's where they add more value and, and where we get that stickiness and the, uh, you know, the value add we can get paid for. So we have a comment from a listener. I have to know that uh, uh, she's a longtime CIO at a publicly held distributor. She says, really interesting. Pricing for value add is always a challenge for distributors. Most don't really know how to do it or are afraid to ask. So first of all, let me suggest to our audience that you've got someone on the line right now who isn't afraid to ask and absolutely knows how to do it. So you should be putting in your questions if you've got them. But Peter, when you describe this, you make it sound like you've just got this approach and this way to do it. And it's, I'm sure it's not simple or easy, but it is well-defined and you are not afraid to bring it up to a customer and you know how to get an answer uh, to the value of this service. And then once you have that, you can, you can price it and to your point, defend it where did you get this? You know, how did you develop this experience? And is, are you just this unicorn who can do it because you're, you have this incredible ability that no one else has, or is this just a matter of distributors not devoting the time and resources to figuring out how to do it? Well, I'm absolutely not a unicorn. I have neither four legs nor a horn. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I think that, uh, what's, what's um, that I see in the background there, Peter? <laughs> yeah. I, I think the, the, um, the reality is that UPM, the company was doing it before I got there, right. all right? So I'm clearly not, a, not, not the only one who can do it. I think that, um, you know, I started doing it back, um, as I say, I think I had an advantage starting out working for a manufacturer and I looked at my distributors as providing services for cost. I never thought a 25% gross margin to a distributor was just what they happened to get for being in the market. I looked at it like I'm paying them 25% to do certain services. If I could do all those things for 15% myself, I'd either lower their margin or do it direct, right? So, so I just always looked at it that way. And, and um, you know, back when we started selling integrated supply programs in 1995, people didn't understand the value. And so we had to build models to show them what their current costs were so that we could show them what the future costs would be to get the advantage because nobody knew what it was, right? When it, back in, in the, the early and the mid, even late nineties, you had to explain to everybody what, what integrated supply was before you could start selling it. And, and everybody thought it sounded kind of like a good idea. Um, and ultimately, the way we sold a lot of the early programs was by guaranteeing the customer savings. Well, how could we do that if we didn't know what their current costs were? And that was kind of the justification is, hey, we'll guarantee you the savings, we'll write you a check for the difference, but we need to agree what your current costs are we're measuring against in order for it to be fair. And, and uh, so that's how it started for me. And I've just gone from that point forward um, with the notion that if you can show customers quantifiably what their costs are and measure your costs against that, they will pay you for the savings. And I think that, but, but when I was at IDG, we had four salespeople and we had 12 analysts, right? We were collecting a lot of data and that, that was our sales model was 
we had to build these very accurate total cost of ownership models for customers. And, and then, you know, the, 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 it becomes a, a self-closing deal. You'd sit down with a big customer and say, your, your total cost last year was 100 million. This year, it'll be 80 million. When do we start? And once they'd, once they'd sold, right, you, you, you never made the proposal until they signed off the current cost was 100 million. I'm not telling you what my solution is because I don't know until I study your business, but we have to agree what your current costs are first. So they sign off on the 100 million as the current cost first. Then you put together your proposal that shows it'll only be 80 million, and then you select the start date. And of course, you don't close 100% of the deals even in that scenario, but we closed a lot of them. So Peter, we have a great question on this point from a Canadian CEO, Bruce. He says, how do you calculate customers fully loaded cost of doing something when they don't have the data or are not willing to share it with you? Well, it's extremely difficult if they don't have it or have it and are unwilling to share it. And that's where the relationship sales piece comes in up front is you have to build trust in order to get the data. Now, at a place like IDG, where we were doing lots of customer cost models, we built our own indexes so we would say to a customer, well, if you don't wanna tell us what your costs are at the first stage of the proposal, we'd say based on your industry and you know, the following factors that are known, your costs are likely X. If that turns out to be true, we can save you Y. If you sign up, you then agree, you will let us go determine what X really is. Um, so so you know, you'd go in with, with that notion of, we could provide you with information about what your costs likely are but almost always in my experience, customers do not know the total cost. And so you have to have a very um, well thought out plan to go know what questions to ask to who in the organization to build those cost models. And uh, you have to be willing to invest in the data collection. I always uh, you know, try to teach my sales teams that we could get slow yeses, but we needed fast no's because you're gonna invest a lot of time and money in the sales process this way. It's not worth doing for small orders, but if you want, if, you're, if your business strategy is to grow with big accounts, you gotta be willing to invest the money. And most of our competitors wouldn't, and that gave us a huge advantage. So, so I think implicit in your answer is, if we have done similar solutions for other similar customers, if we're not just doing one-offs in other right. words, we may have an analog in, in, in your industry from which we can estimate that. Exactly. So I, so, I, so I think also in your process, I'm guessing where you're going in and observing, you're hopefully spotting recurring patterns between customers. No uh, question. Not just one-offs within an existing customer, right? No, no question. These, we, we would say, you know, every solution is unique, but 80% of it was the same, right? And, and as I say, in our, at, at, at UPM today, we basically just cut metal. And, and we can cut lots of different ways and lots of different kinds of metal, but it's so, so um, you know, we don't believe that we only have a hammer and, and you know, every problem looks like a nail. But on the other hand, we're not starting with an infinite universe either. And, and I think that, you know, for Bruce, whatever segment he's in, there should be a pattern amongst the products that he's supplying and the way customers are using them. And, and it's hard at the beginning because you don't have the data if you haven't tried to collect it before. But as you build up that database of, uh, of cost analysis, it's another competitive advantage that becomes a barrier for other people who want to come along. Because what happens when you go in and start taking big accounts away is your competitors will turn around and say to the customer, well, we can do whatever they can do and we'll do it for 2% less, even though they have no idea what they're signing up for. Um, but it's a routine response, right? Don't lose the account, promise anything. And, and uh, the more data that you have on your side, the more credibility, the more easily, you know, you can demonstrate to your account that, yeah, they can't really do what we can do. Ask them to show you all their information about the topic. So, so, I haven't, I haven't, I, go ahead, Ian. so, well, Bruce's point, he asked the really two parts to his question, what do you do if they don't have the data? And it sounds like, well, if you have the expertise, you can help them develop the data, if they're not willing to share it with you, that just sounds like a fast no. It is to me, because if they're not willing to share it, then how are they going to agree to measure what the impact of the program was? 
And if they're not willing to measure the impact of the program, they're going to end up judging your solution purely on price versus your competitors. And that's not our game. And, and again, that's a great game for people whose solution is to be low cost provider wherever they go. But that's not the game that, that my company wants to play. We have another question, but just a comment on myself. Whenever I have a hammer, everything looks like a screw. That's just how it works out. I don't. <laughs> that explains your, 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 your DIY projects. <laughs> exactly. So have you ever had a negative reaction because someone in lower level management felt like someone went around them behind their back, leading to some kind of internal sabotage? Absolutely, yes. Yep. Okay. So there's no question. There's no question it's, it's it, there that um, um, I would say I've been doing this long enough that I've had an adverse reaction of some sort from everybody at every level in every organization. Um, you know, it just doesn't go smoothly. Um, everybody's happy. But if you're delivering enough value, um, you know, I, 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 I think that it, it works enough for the time to justify the approach. I would say that you do have to manage that. And if your current relationships are at a level that can't help you, um, then I think you know the approach that we would take is 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 one of kind of the the um, ally. Hey, Mr. Lower Level Manager, we've got a great idea. If why don't you sell this up in the organization and you can be the hero, right? So you you try and enlist their support to take it upstream. Um, as opposed to you, you know trying to go around your current relationship, but uh, I, I have found nothing that works all the time. So I don't want to sit here and sound like a know-it-all. I, I found things that work enough of the time to justify doing them, but they certainly don't work all the time. So when you think about the impact, when you when you think about the impact that a distributor is just is driving for a end customer, what are some of the kinds of things that you some, some of the categories of benefit or impact that, you, that you've come across? Well, you know, I think th this is a key part of that relationship building up front is understanding what the customer's internal metrics are, right? If a customer is balance sheet focused, looking at return on capital, you can certainly reduce inventory, reduce their working capital deployed. If a company is, is a PE owned company and they're focused on EBITDA, you're gonna try and drive cost reductions or margin enhancement for the customer at that end, and they're not going to be as concerned with with the balance sheet. So, to me, it all comes down to the customer's internal metrics. What's most important to you, Mister Customer? That's the thing we'll attack. Great. So it's customer driven. Yes, yeah, customer driven, and and I think that, you know, it's all part of the process of defining the solution that adds the most value. Adds the most value to who? And that depends on how the customer measures value. Um, I would say it is hard when customers only want to look at the piece part price. Um, it's harder if they tell you that's the only thing they care about, to Jonathan's point. In my history, that's usually turned into a fast now. But if they're willing to look at the total cost of the organization, and, and most companies, you know, the metrics are pretty clear. They're looking at uh, earnings per share. They're looking at EBITDA if they're PE owned. You know, they're, they, they may be, and a lot of family companies with longer out terms will look at return on capital, but whatever their most important metric is, you figure out the numerator and denominator and figure out which one you can impact the most. And that's how you design your value added service. So we have a listener here who read my mind, uh, Ellen again, uh, in terms of the question, she says, what is the status of quote unquote integrated supply today versus pure process value add? Part one, integrated supply versus today versus per pure process value add. Second part is, did integrated supply as a business model really work? Why or why not? Um, well, we sold IDG for 14 times EBITDA, so I'd say the model worked. <laughs> okay. but, but, but what's interesting is a lot of big distributors tried it, the big legacy distributors, and got out of it. So Yeah, I think you've hit on a key note there, um, Ian. Being an integrated supplier is different than being a distributor. Yes. And um, uh, I just went through this with a company that, that was looking for a little um, consulting help a couple of weeks ago. And, and if you, the, the premise of integrated supply is a, fundamentally was based on in the original days, eliminating redundant steps in the channel. 
that and and if you maintain all of the redundant steps in the channel but just provide more service to the customer the economics don't work and and when it worked at companies like idg it's because integrated supply was a separate division from the branch based business and and in that model integrated supply absolutely worked um, it generated a higher return and a higher growth rate than traditional distribution did. Uh, but you have to be very disciplined about the cost that you build into your business. And, and when you have traditional distributors, in my experience, they keep running things through the branches and through the traditional cost structure that is not in fact eliminating the redundant steps, right? The fundamental premise was instead of having the distributor repeat all the actions the customer did, buy the goods, receive them, put them away, pull them off the shelf again, pack and deliver them. And then the distributor, the customer would have a warehouse where they brought the parts in and repeated every step. We would just put our branch inside the customer's plant. The goods would ship directly from pick somebody 3M into Coors Brewing and be put away on the shelf and issued. And it eliminated a significant amount of cost. Millions of dollars of savings to Coors Brewing each year and a profitable model for the integrated supplier. Right, so the, if the integrated supplier was really just a Trojan horse to drive sales to you directly, preferably over anybody else, then you really weren't living up to the primary value add of an integrated supplier. It's a, it's a really expensive sales model. Yeah. Right? If all you're doing is using integrated supply to sell out of your branch, it's right. the most expensive sales model in distribution. If yeah. you're using it as a different channel to get product from the producer to the consumer, it can be an efficiency improvement. But it's very hard, in my experience, for legacy large-scale branch-based distributors to truly become efficient integrated suppliers. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I get it. And the other, so her other question was, how do you distinguish between integrated supply today versus a pure process value add? Yeah, I. I I don't want to pretend I know exactly what she means okay. um, because I don't. Um, I would say if by pure process, she means somebody who's just performing the transactions for the customer and not taking title and reselling the goods. There are some integrated supply models I'm aware of, you know, where the integrated suppliers using their manufacturer relationships, but the goods kind of change hands upon receipt. To me, that really just has to do with who owns the inventory. It's not, it's, it's not really, so I'm not sure exactly what she means by that and be happy to answer a follow-up question. Um, but I, I, I don't, I don't know what, how to answer that one. Well, so I think what it means to me is you do a lot of process value add at, at United Metals, right? Where yeah. you are. Yeah, and that's not running. integrated supply at all. Got it. Right. That's just a, that's value add, but it's not really making the purchasing process more efficient. It's making the customer's production process more efficient. Yes. And, 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 and that's probably what she meant because it makes sense. And I would say yeah. at UPM, we do not do integrated supply. Got it. We, right. we, 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 we're adding value through processing. At right. the other companies I've been at, we did it through an integrated supply model. So totally separate. And I apologize if I confused anyone with that. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's see here. So uh, Peter, you've been doing this for a long time and you've got, you, you've been in this integrated supply environment, really mastered it, sold a company for 14 times earnings, which is great. And now you're in United Metals where you're just doing a high level of value add but you've really spent your career outside of, I'm going to buy this stuff, I'm going to put it in stock, and I'm going to ship it out in the same form that I bought it in. Um, and so how hard is it for other distributors who are in that sort of ladder model where it's, you know, I buy, hold, stock, and sell? Uh, how do they get started in doing what you're, in, in, in adding more value, whether it's an integrated supply or more likely in process ad, you know, what, what are the first steps? Because we look at distributor websites all the time. They don't even present their services well, and they usually don't charge for any of them, right? Or maybe just a couple of them. They don't have anybody in charge of their services. They don't have a services p &L. They're, They just give them away and they're buried in the, the product price is supposed to carry the burden of that as well as the, the markup from the SKU itself. So how do they get started in moving into the types of work that you've been doing with distributors all along? Um, well, first I'd say, I, I wouldn't say anyone should feel an obligation that they have to, right? If you're, do, if you're happy with the results you're getting today and you're not worried about threats, 
I mean, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I, but fundamentally for me, it all comes down to solving problems and creating efficiencies. So I would, if it was me, um, you know, like when we got, it was in a building products company, totally different, but we looked at it and said, hey, track home builders make their money on upgrades, not, not on the standard items that go in the, the base price home. What if we put together a bundle of products to, to go into their um, selection centers, their design centers, um, and where we could make all our money on the upgrade too, and that solved a problem for the builder because the builder wants the lowest price possible on the base home, knowing that 80% of the people upgrade the finishes. Um, so we put together a design center program for them. To me, that was just a case of saying, what's the builder's problem, right? That we can help them solve. And right. I, I would go back to that for any company in any industry is your customers have challenges. The better you know your customers, the better you know their challenges. Start to catalog what the challenges are and then look at which ones do I think we could get good at solving? You know, it's probably not gonna be all of them, but pick one or two where you think I could get better at solving that problem. My customer doesn't wanna solve that problem. Right. And, and uh, you know, that starts the process. And it, to me, to randomly just pick a service out of the air and say, hey, I'm gonna go offer this now because I've seen it on TV or whatever, doesn't make any sense. I'd look at my own customers and say, what problems, and what problem doesn't exist at just one customer, but exists at a group of customers, where if I get good at this, I'll have the leverage of providing the service across multiple locations. And sometimes that's like repair. Like you have a whole bunch of customers that need a small amount of uh, power tool repair. Well, maybe you go into the power tool repair business and you can keep a shop dedicated because you're collecting power tools from 10 accounts. Uh, I, just as kind of a made up example, but I, I start with what are my customers' problems that I see as a trend across multiple customers? And, and that's where the math begins. Yeah, and I tell you, I've seen that repair trend in a fleet rental where you just, you know, people just rent concrete hammers at 50 at a time on a job site and you just make sure that when they break down you pick them up and keep them productive and so they turn that repair into a strategic benefit for the customer beyond just fixing the product um but i think it all starts with like you have to have a plan and and when we work with distributors a lot of times they're not very good at strategic planning because they haven't had to be they right. haven't really had to change but now you do and so as you go through your strategic plan you need to identify this mode of adding value with services and making sure that you're getting paid for it and you are defining cost and have a method for selling it and working out, you know, the pricing with the customer, that's all new. And you're not going to develop it organically in the field probably, and then extrapolate it out to the rest of the company. You probably need to make it a corporate initiative. Does that make sense to you? Totally. I, I, I use the word intentional a lot when all my companies is we have to have an intention about what we do and right. I think that that's for value added services, it's critical. I don't know how it could not be part of your strategic planning process. Right. I mean, to me, if your strategic planning process results in the decision that you're not gonna add any value added services, great. But you, it should be a conscious decision, not, a, not a, uh, you, you know, a default position. And if right. you decide you're gonna do it, then you need to go through these steps of saying, okay, we're gonna have to you know, put our 20 biggest customers on a, on a whiteboard, what are the problems? below each one, okay, look across, where, where do we see three or four customers with the same problem? And all of a sudden you've got an area to start digging into. But I think you have to make it absolutely part of your planning process. And if you're just going along responding to the market and not planning, then you, you're likely gonna be adding services you don't get paid for, um, and maybe not the ones that make the most sense to your customers. And distributors have plenty of those today. They don't need to add more. So, uh, Peter, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight to talk with you and uh, you're welcome back anytime on our show. And I'm very happy to finally make your acquaintance that Jonathan has been trying to facilitate for a long time. So, Jonathan, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic discussion. We hope you'll join us. This is, on... this is his way of saying you lived up to the billing. Yes, oh, well, you did. I... You live up to the billing. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I have a lot of passion around distribution strategy, and uh, I, uh, I'm constantly trying to think about ways to get better. So uh, I, I appreciate you asking me to be part of your program today. Us too. Distribution strategy is in our name. Uh, hey. so, so I hope you'll all join us on Wednesday, May 26th. We'll have a quarterly earnings checkup on Fastenal, MSC, Beacon Roofing, and CDW. We'll be looking at some numbers, offering our insights, and on May 19th, 
So coming up soon, we have a special webinar coming up with NAW called Pandemic Effects on Distributors. Now, I know we're all sick and tired of hearing about the pandemic, but this is about lessons learned and revealing a bunch of data that we're getting from distribution executives right now on things like, well, hey, how well did your sales reps perform during the pandemic? And are you going to do anything differently with them after the pandemic? And they're telling us things like, yeah, they need to make more phone and Zoom calls. And our work from home people were just as productive or more productive. So we're going to change our policies somewhat. And then we're asking about digital capabilities. How do they perform? What are you going to do differently? CRMs. So it's really about what lessons did you learn from the pandemic that you can apply going forward? So we hope you'll join us on May 19th at two o'clock Eastern. You can reach all three of us. Our contact information is on the right, including Peter's at the bottom. Uh, you can also visit our website anytime at distributionstrategy.com. Peter, Jonathan, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And we'll see you all in a couple of weeks on the Wholesale Chain Show. Bye now.